So there's this kind of weird, twisted story from Greek mythology about a guy named Procrustes. Have you heard this one? He was obviously a psychopath serial killer. He lived in a remote part of Attica, Greece. And Procrustes had this strange obsession. As the myth goes, he would offer shelter to travelers that were passing through. He would invite them to spend the night in his house and sleep in his bed. I should have been kind of a warning sign right there. A little bit of a red flag. But once inside, these travelers would become his prisoners. And he would torture them in a strange and cruel way. If a guest was too tall for the bed, Procrustes would amputate their limbs to make them fit. And if a guest was too short for the bed, he would stretch the body until it matched the bed's dimensions. And this is the story where we get the metaphor of the Procrustean bed, which is a term that we use to describe a situation where something is being forced to fit into a predetermined and often contrived set of parameters, even if doing that requires distortion and mutilation. Now, I want you to remember this metaphor because I'm going to refer back to it again later in this episode and then especially in the next episode. But first, let me tell you another story. This one is about a British philosopher by the name of Anthony Flew, who wrote a book in 1975 called Thinking About Thinking. And in that book, Flew coined a term for a logical fallacy that had been recognized probably forever. But, you know, sometimes a person comes along and just describes something perfectly, and it sticks. And what Flew coined in that book was the no true Scotsman fallacy. And here's how it works. No true Scotsman puts brown sugar on his porridge. The fact that Angus McGregor puts brown sugar on his porridge just proves that he is no true Scotsman. Now, why is this a logical fallacy? Well, because the person is redefining the category of Scotsman to exclude someone that doesn't fit into their special idea of what a true Scotsman is. And so the no true Scotsman fallacy is when someone redefines a term or a category in an arbitrary manner that is done intentionally to exclude counterexamples and to make their argument more tenable. It's shifting goalposts in order to avoid addressing counterexamples by essentially saying that doesn't count because it doesn't fit my narrow definition. And it's a way of maintaining an argument by arbitrarily changing the terms to exclude inconvenient evidence. Now, why am I talking about Procrustes and Scotsman here? Well, this is the seventh episode in our series on the heresy of cessationism. And we've already seen that cessationists don't have any scriptural support for their doctrine. So what they end up trying to do is to make rational arguments for cessationism. And that can be a pretty difficult task, especially if you're trying to use the Bible, which is a completely continuationist book, to make those arguments. And sometimes people are persuaded by these arguments, even though they're actually quite poor and irrational. And guys, if you're being persuaded by this stuff, my friend, you just need to learn how to think. I wish they would teach logic in high school because I feel like so many people are just lacking the basic tools for thinking clearly. And that leads me to our topic today. In the last couple episodes, we've been discussing various gifts of the spirit that are often at the heart of this cessationism debate. We've talked about prophecy and tongues. In the last episode, we talked about healing. And often healing and miracles are so closely related that they're almost used interchangeably. But there's one important argument that cessationists make about miracles specifically that I feel like we just need to address in some depth before moving on. What if I told you that there was actually only a combined time frame of about 200 years in all of biblical and human history where God was performing miracles? And the rest of biblical history, the rest of human history was essentially cessationist. Now, I think that for almost everyone that hasn't already heard this argument, whether you're a cessationist or a continuationist, it sounds like an outrageous claim. Isn't the entire story of the Bible the story of God doing miracles? Well, according to cessationists, the answer is actually no. And they say they can prove that from Scripture. So I call this argument the rare miracle hypothesis. Here's how cessationist pastor Tom Pennington put it. Quote, Now throughout history, biblical history, God occasionally intervened with direct miracles. But in thousands of years of human history, there were only about 200 years in which God empowered men to work miracles. And even then, miracles were not accomplished every day, end quote. And so cessationists that teach this believe 
that the only reason, or at least the primary reason, that God does miracles is to give divine confirmation to a prophet and his message, essentially. Pennington said, quote, the primary purpose of miracles has always been to confirm the credentials of a divinely appointed messenger to establish the credibility of one who speaks for God, not one who teaches or explains the word of God, but one in whose mouth God has put his very words, end quote. And so these miraculous confirmations are, in Pennington's view, exceedingly rare in history. And so in light of this, the non-miraculous environment of the church today is actually nothing unusual. It would be the historical norm, and we ought to just accept it. And in order to illustrate this, Pennington gives us three short time periods, 65 to 70 years each, in which God did miracles. And of course, this view is not unique to Pennington. In fact, I've read this argument from almost every cessationist theologian I've read from the time of B.B. Warfield onward, but I guess this summary is as good as any. He says, quote, the first time period talking about here was that of Moses and Joshua. That period lasted from the Exodus to about 1445 BC through the career of Joshua that ended in about 1380 BC. In other words, that first period of miracles lasted about 65 years. The second window when miracles were common was during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha, putting again the biblical chronology together. They ministered from about 860 BC until 795 BC, again a period of only about 65 years. The third time of miracles was Christ and his apostles. Obviously, it began with his ministry and lasted at the very longest until the death of the apostle John, or about 70 years, end quote. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, it seems like the scriptures are just replete with miracle accounts from beginning to end. So that cessationism would not only contradict the New Testament explicitly, but it would just cut against the grain of the entire testimony of Scripture. But actually, cessationists like Pennington claim the exact opposite. Pennington says, quote, I think that most charismatics think that miracles litter almost every page of biblical history. In reality, there were only three primary periods in which God worked miracles through uniquely gifted men. In other words, there were only three primary periods when God gave human beings miracle-working power. Now, we're going to look at the technicalities of this argument in a minute, but let's just take a step back for a second and consider the Bible as a whole. What do we see from the witness of Scripture? Does the Bible strike you as a cessationist book? You know, when you're reading the Bible and you come across some supernatural story of someone being healed or supernaturally protected or something, do you go, really? That's in the Bible? And look at the front cover just to make sure you're reading the right book? But when you read the Bible, you don't have that reaction, do you? Why? Because the Bible is all about the supernatural. It's all about the miraculous from beginning to end. In fact, the very first thing that you read on the very first page of the Bible is a miracle. Everything begins with a miracle. All of existence created ex nihilo by the word of God. And from that point on, it's just miracle after miracle after miracle. Let me just give you a few of the categories that biblical miracles fall into. There's superhuman abilities, like when Moses did two back-to-back 40-day fasts without food or water, or when Elijah was unable to outrun Ahab's chariot to Jezreel. Or how about when Samson kills a lion with his bare hands? Or when he kills a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone? Or when he rips those massive city gates out of the wall and carries them to the top of the hill on his shoulders? So those are miracles of superhuman strength. There's also teleportation. I know that's not the biblical word. We would usually say translation, but you know what I mean. Teleportation like Elijah being carried from place to place by the Spirit of God. Or like Philip being snatched away after he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch and carried to another city 30 miles away. I think the most amazing one is when the disciples were in the storm in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and the Bible says that Jesus went to them walking on the water and got into the boat. And that's amazing, but what happened next is even wilder. It says that the disciples had only rowed about three or four miles into the sea's eight-mile width. But when Jesus joined them, it says that immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So the Spirit suspended 13 men and a Galilean fishing boat from the limits of time and space and shot them four or five miles in less than a nanosecond. So there's superhuman abilities and teleportation, but not only did the Spirit of God transport people to new earthly locations, sometimes he transported people to places in the Spirit. 
And I think sometimes we could simply classify these experiences as visions. Sometimes they were much more complicated. Sometimes people would fall into a trance that seemed to numb them to all external stimuli, like a spiritual Novocaine. And they would go into an altered state of consciousness where they received profound spiritual revelation and experiences that apparently felt very, very real to them. In some cases, it's almost like the spirit lifted people out of their bodies and transported them somewhere else. In other words, they did not seem to be transported bodily anywhere, but the spirits traveled to places in heaven or on earth, wherever it was, they were in the visions of God, like it says in Ezekiel 8. For example, Paul said that in one experience, he didn't know if he was in or out of his body. So again, these spiritual experiences are difficult to categorize, but we might broadly describe them as trances, visions, and travel in the spirit realm. For example, in his vision of the Valley of Dry Bones, Ezekiel used language that made it sound like he was actually having physical interaction with an actual place. The experience was so vivid and interactive, it seems like the word vision falls short in describing it. Ezekiel didn't merely have a vision. It seems like he was actually in the vision, as if his spirit was taken to a different place than his body. And it was like he was actually present to the things that he saw. And these are, interestingly, very similar to the kind of descriptions that we read about in the book of Revelation, where John, you know, he started out in a prison cell, but then he had to come up out of that cell through a door into a massive heavenly auditorium. And suddenly he's there, invited to witness the highest court in the universe. As John himself explained, all of this was in the spirit. Daniel also had some pretty wild visions. Some of these were also interactive and so intense that he said it drained his energy and disturbed his soul. One night he had a dream in which he saw visions that graphically described the future of the nations of the world and the kingdom of God. He saw hybrid beasts emerging out of watery chaos. And then similar to John, he saw how the heavenly council was judging those beasts. Paul said that he was caught up to paradise and he heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. And his revelations were so surpassingly great that God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him from becoming too proud. Paul also fell into a trance on one occasion when Jesus warned him to flee to Jerusalem. That was in Acts 22. Peter had a trance come over him while he prayed on a rooftop in Acts 10. So keep in mind that with all of these categories, I'm only giving you a small partial sampling of the examples that I could cite. But the Holy Spirit often did lift human servants into these unseen realms of visions, even if he didn't physically move their bodies. So we have superhuman abilities, teleportation, trances, visions, and travel in the spirit realm. What about healing the sick? might surprise you to know that this is not just a New Testament thing. In the Old Testament, Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, Isaiah, Hezekiah, all of these people prayed for or prophesied over people that were healed. And then, of course, once the New Testament era began, the Spirit's healing ministry increased exponentially through Jesus and the apostles. But it wasn't just healing the sick, it was also raising the dead, which, by the way, is something that we see in both Old and New Testaments, from people like Elijah and Elisha, Peter, Paul, and of course, Jesus. We have miracles of multiplication. There's a few of these in the life of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. And then, of course, Jesus fed the multitudes. He multiplied food twice. There's also miracles of provision, like manna in the wilderness, or when Moses caused water to come out of the rock for the children of Israel, or Jesus turning water into wine. So again, we have superhuman abilities, teleportation, trances, visions, travel in the spirit realm, healing the sick, miracles of provision. What about miracles of protection? Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, or Daniel in the lion's den, or the way God protected Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and David, and Jeremiah in the Old Testament, and so many others. Paul was bitten by a poisonous snake that should have killed him. They tried to throw Jesus off a cliff, but he escaped by walking through the crowd. And there's so, so many more of these. So in a similar vein to that, we also have miracles of supernatural deliverance. I'm thinking of things like God delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt or the way that God miraculously saved his people from the exile. Remember how he actually used King Cyrus of Persia as his anointed deliverer. And, you know, even though it was only a remnant that returned to the land, the prophets clearly 
said that this was supernatural. God rescuing the Jews from Haman's evil plot in the book of Esther, that was miraculous. The apostles were supernaturally delivered from prison on three separate occasions in the New Testament. So again, we have superhuman abilities, teleportation, trances, visions, travel in the spirit realm, healing the sick, miracles of protection, miracles of provision, miracles of supernatural deliverance. Here's another one, miracles of nature. These are some of the wildest ones, like parting the Red Sea and the Jordan River, or Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. I don't even know how to understand that miracle. What about Elijah starting and ending a famine? What about Jesus commanding a storm to stop and walking on the water? Then we have casting out demons. Now, look, this is mostly a New Testament thing, but even in the Old Testament, we see a kind of precursor to this. Remember in 1 Samuel 16, 12, it says that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David. And then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day forward. And soon after that event, we see that Saul and his household actually call for David to come to the palace and play his harp to drive away that evil spirit. So after the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David, he is able to drive away evil spirits. And guess what? The Holy Spirit's anointing was also the source of Jesus' power to cast out demons. Now, of course, the presence of the Spirit is the source of power for all of Christ's miracles in the New Testament. But the Gospels draw particular attention to the Holy Spirit's role in casting out demons. It's very significant. And of course, there are so many accounts in, in the New Testament of deliverance, I can't even scratch the surface. But look, casting out demons is one of the hallmarks of the coming of the kingdom of God. And this is just an interesting side note about why cessationism is so wrong. You know, demons have not stopped their evil work. And demons have not stopped possessing people and giving them dark, evil powers. And I even think most cessationists acknowledge that. And in fact, it seems like if cessationists see something supernatural that they can't deny, even within the charismatic Christian world, I've heard them attribute it to the power of Satan or kundalini spirits or whatever. So they still believe in the supernatural manifestations of the power of the devil. It's just the supernatural manifestations of the power of God that they doubt. And as far as I know, cessationists still believe in the Great Commission. So they believe God is still sending us into all the world to preach the gospel. That command hasn't changed. It's just that now, in a cessationist worldview, he doesn't send us out with the ability to do things anymore like cast out demons. We're just kind of like a policeman being sent out into the worst part of town unarmed. Anyway, I digress. Casting out demons is one very common miraculous manifestation that we see in the New Testament. What about prophetic dreams and interpretation of dreams? You know, it's amazing to me how God entrusted such important messages to dreams. I'm talking about messages that changed the course of history. Our spiritual forefathers took dreams very, very seriously, and we should be thankful that they did. God used dreams to help the patriarchs. Joseph changed the world, not only with his dreams, but with his ability to interpret dreams. Again, Daniel, he had dreams that contained intense apocalyptic visions where he saw a panorama of world history from Babylon to the day of the Lord. In the New Testament, Joseph, the husband of Mary, he also had dreams that protected Jesus as a child. And several others experienced these miraculous dreams as well, from Solomon to Pilate's wife, from Job to the Magi in the East. So we have, again, superhuman abilities, teleportation, trances, visions, travel in the spirit, healing the sick, miracles of protection, miracles of provision, supernatural deliverance, miracles of nature, casting out demons, prophetic dreams, and interpretation of dreams. And then there's also the supernatural ability to predict the future. Like, for example, Hosea and Isaiah foretelling the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel to the Assyrians, and Isaiah predicting his nation's immediate and distant future all the way to the end of time with stunning accuracy. Or how about Jeremiah predicting that Judah would be taken captive by Babylon about 50 years before it happened? And then he predicted specifically that the captivity would last for 70 years, after which Babylon would be punished and made to be desolate forever, and everything happened exactly the way that he prophesied. Several prophets predicted not only Judah's return from exile, but also Judah's and Israel's ultimate restoration at the end of the age. 
And there's a lot more in the Old Testament. It's more than we have time to talk about. But then when we come to the New Testament, John, Jesus, and others predicted the future. Some of those prophecies have already come to pass, like Jesus' death and resurrection and the fall of Jerusalem. Others are still ahead of us. Another thing we see, especially from the prophetic figures in Scripture, is the supernatural revelation of specific personal and factual information. And, of course, a crazy example of this I've mentioned in a previous podcast is that story of how Saul, before he was anointed to be king, remember the story, he was searching for his father's lost donkeys. It says that he searched through five territories, couldn't find them. So it goes to the prophet, Samuel, and when he got there, Samuel already knew that he was coming. The Lord had told Samuel in advance, about this time tomorrow, I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him ruler over my people Israel. So by the time that Saul gets there, Samuel knew he was coming, knew what he was looking for, told him when the donkeys got lost, told them that they had been found. And that's not all. Samuel went on to give Saul a list of instructions for his journey. He told Saul the people that he was going to meet on the way and specific events that would come to pass. And it says that all those signs came about on that day. It just shows how crazy accurate the level of detail is that God can reveal to people. We also see this with Elisha, who knew the secret details of Gehazi's meeting with Naaman. Remember, he said, my spirit went with you. Of course, Jesus supernaturally knew Simon by name before they met. He had supernatural knowledge about Nathaniel and the Samaritan woman, and the list goes on and on. What about competitive displays of power, like the showdowns with Pharaoh's magicians or the showdowns with the priests of Baal or Simon the sorcerer? And then there's physical manifestations and unusual miracles. And guys, there's so many of these, I don't even know where to start, but I'm thinking about things like when the skin of Moses' face literally shined with divine light, or Jesus transfiguring in front of some of the disciples, or when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden, they fell backwards onto the ground, or talking donkeys, or bitter water being made sweet, or dust becoming gnats and rivers turning to blood. Guys, sometimes God's works just simply defy any kind of description or explanation. Like God said to Isaiah, I will again confound these people with wonder after wonder. The Lord of the Scriptures, he doesn't ask our permission or check with our theology to see what kind of things he can do in the world. And look, even God's voice being revealed to people is miraculous. God is not within the closed system of the natural universe. So when God speaks, that is something coming from above and beyond the natural, a.k.a. supernatural. So again, let's just review. In the Bible, we see miracles of superhuman abilities, teleportation, translation, trances, visions, travel in the spirit realm, healing the sick, miracles of protection, miracles of provision, supernatural deliverance, miracles of nature, casting out demons, prophetic dreams and interpretation of dreams, the ability to predict the future, revelation of specific personal and factual information, competitive displays of power, physical manifestations, unusual miracles, and the hearing of God's voice. Now, with all of that in your mind, look at what the famous cessationist theologian B.B. Warfield said, quote, Miracles do not appear on the pages of Scripture vagrantly, here and there and elsewhere indifferently, without assignable reason. They belong to revelation periods and appear only when God is speaking to his people through accredited messengers declaring his gracious purposes. Their abundant display in the apostolic church is the mark of the richness of the apostolic age in revelation. And when this revelation period closed, the period of miracle working had passed by also as a mere matter of course, end quote. So, according to Warfield, miracles belong to periods of revelation and their abundant displays in the apostolic church is the mark of the richness in revelation of the apostolic age. Man, this sounds like the whole Bible, doesn't it? I mean, the entire Bible is a revelation from God, the ultimate revelation, in fact. And so, in light of that, It ought to just be overflowing with miracles, right? Well, according to cessationists, no. Despite what Warfield said in that quote we just read, he and other cessationists taught that miracle working is actually quite rare in the Bible. In fact, like we said earlier, according to cessationists, there was only a couple hundred years in all of human history when God was actually using miracle workers. But this is such contradictory logic, isn't it? I mean, again, if, as Warfield says, miracles belong to revelation periods, 
That would be all through the Bible, right? I mean, show me a page in this book that was not written during a period of revelation. The whole point of this is that it's all God's ultimate revelation. And the contradictions with this argument go on and on. I don't have time to camp here, although I'm tempted to. But for example, Tom Pennington said that, quote, the primary purpose of miracles has always been to confirm the credentials of a divinely appointed messenger to establish the credibility of one who speaks for God, end quote. But hold on, weren't guys like Joel and Amos divinely appointed messengers? Where's their miracles? John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet, and according to Jesus, the greatest man ever born of a woman. Not only that, he was the one that announced the arrival of the Messiah. You could argue that John delivered the greatest message of any prophet that ever lived outside Jesus Christ himself. And yet in John 10, 41, it says that John performed no miracle. And then on the flip side, what was the message that Elijah and Elisha brought that was so unique? I mean, these guys were working miracles like every day. If cessationists were right, that miracles were all about confirming the credentials of a divinely appointed messenger, don't you think that they would have had the most incredible revolutionary message of all? But that doesn't seem to be the case. What message did they bring that was so superior to people like Micah and Obadiah that didn't have any similar miracles? In fact, you could probably even argue that Elijah and Elisha were less significant than many other Old Testament prophets from whom we have no recorded working of miracles. And even in the case of the special miracle workers, the ones that cessationists mention, like you know Elijah and Elisha and Moses, what makes cessationists believe? that their miracles were only performed to confirm their credentials. Now, certainly they did so. How could they not? But on the other hand, many of the miracles that they worked didn't seem to serve that purpose at all. And again, if epic miracles are required to confirm the credentials of a messenger, then why should we listen to men like David or Solomon, who didn't perform that kind of miracle that we see from Moses and Elijah ever? Why should we accept the book of Esther? There's no miracle performed there. But of course, we know that cessationists accept all the books in the Bible, even the ones written by or about messengers that did not perform any miracles. And they accept these non-miraculous scriptures as inspired and authoritative. But I thought that cessationists told us that the primary purpose of miracles has always been to confirm the credentials of a divinely appointed messenger, to establish the credibility of one who speaks for God. So I guess sometimes the credentials of a divinely appointed messenger are confirmed by miracles, but sometimes they're not. But if some messengers don't need miracles to confirm their credentials, why do any? Maybe you say, well, it's the ones with really important messages that need miracles. Uh, again, John performed no miracle, and Elijah performed tons, while John introduced God's ultimate revelation, and Elijah didn't introduce any. Okay, so maybe not everyone divinely appointed has miracles, but everyone who does have miracles is definitely divinely appointed, right? Um, not so fast. Won't there be workers of miracles to whom Christ says, I never knew you? Didn't Moses warn the children of Israel about false prophets that could produce signs and wonders? Won't the lawless one that it talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2 also produce signs and lying wonders? Look, Judas performed miracles. There were some that were casting out demons that weren't even followers of Jesus in Luke 9. So again, let me just summarize this for you. Number one, miracles are not exclusive to divinely appointed messengers. Right? I mean, sometimes they're performed by Pharaoh's magicians or by those to whom Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. Number two, many who were special messengers, who were actually speaking for God, performed no miracle, like Joel and Amos and John the Baptist. And three, even when miracles were performed by divinely appointed messengers, they were not always connected to any special message whatsoever. And we haven't even touched on the New Testament realities yet, like the way that the gift of the working of miracles in the New Testament, which is really what is at the heart of this cessationist argument, is definitely not connected to any special messengers, even if Old Testament miracles were. In the New Testament, the gift of the working of miracles, like all of the other gifts, are given for the common good and the edification of the body, and listed right along with things like hospitality and generosity and pastors and teachers. And so, making a case that miracles are exceedingly rare, 
and only meant to validate certain messengers. And this suggests that cessationism is the biblical norm. This seems to be a super flimsy argument, to say the least. And yet, as Pennington said, quote, in thousands of years of human history, there were only about 200 years in which God empowered men to work miracles, and even then, miracles were not accomplished every day, end quote. Now look, a few minutes ago, I listed more than a dozen categories of miracles that you can read about through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And yet what these cessationist teachers are suggesting is that the whole Bible is actually cessationist, except for these three short windows of time where God was doing miracles through uniquely gifted men. How can they make that claim? Well, I want you to watch very carefully what they're doing. It's not really sophisticated at all. It's just a cheap kind of press the digitation, like a pickpocket would use, to distract you with one hand while he robs you blind with the other. It's sleight of hand. It's like a sketchy two-bit shell game operator at the county fair. Now, once you see this trick, you can't unsee it. So watch carefully. Cessationists that make this argument that I call the rare miracle hypothesis, or maybe more accurately, the rare miracle worker hypothesis, they're doing this in two steps. First, what they do is to come up with a special definition of what constitutes a miracle. Because here's the thing, if you get to define what the word miracle means, then you can exclude anything that you want to by definition. So here, check out this ridiculously specific and completely unnecessarily complicated definition of miracle, courtesy of B.B. Warfield. He says a miracle is a, quote, force outside of nature, and specifically above nature, intruding into the complex of natural forces and producing, therefore, in that complex, effects which could not be produced by the natural forces themselves. These effects reveal themselves, therefore, as new, but not as neonatural, but rather as extra-natural, and specifically as supernatural, end quote. Now, where in the world does he get that definition? Well, as far as I can tell, like I said in a previous episode, these cessationists are just making stuff up left and right. When we look at the biblical word for miracle, like what Paul used in 1 Corinthians 12.10, it's just the word dunamis, which is the word for power. And in the New Testament, this is a word that's used in the context of the power to heal, power to deliver from demons, power to work miracles. It's actually quite a flexible word, and there's nothing even sort of close to the kind of technical definition that we just read from Warfield. So again, the first step of this cheap trick that we talked about is to arbitrarily amputate and manipulate the definition of miracle to make an ad hoc argument. This is that Procrustean bed that I was talking about earlier. We make the definition of miracle fit our argument rather than allowing the Bible to define miracle and then adapting our theology accordingly. But there's one more step because even by that cessationist Procrustean bed definition of miracle, these miracles are still all throughout the entire biblical record. So what they have to do is add one more constraint to that argument. It's not just miracles that are rare. It's miracle workers. It's men like Moses and Elijah and Jesus who perform these miracles as a sign. That's what's rare. And this is where we find a great example of that no true Scotsman fallacy. But in this case, it's not all true Scotsman. It's all true miracle workers fallacy. All true miracle workers would be able to part the sea or call fire down from heaven. Why? Well, because that's the only way our silly argument works. Guys, like I've already said, the Bible is full of stories of supernatural activity. Anyone reading the Bible without being brainwashed would just conclude that miracles are the norm in Scripture. But then cessationist teachers come along and say, we're just going to change the rules to the game here so the Bible supports our narrative. They're drawing a target around the arrow. But here's the problem, the obvious problem. When cessationist teachers paint this picture of cessationism as the biblical norm, based on this special definition of miracle and miracle workers, what they're doing is conveniently excluding the vast, overwhelming amount of biblical information that falsifies their position. What about the miraculous empowerment of the judges like Samson? What about miraculous victories in battle like Gideon's? What about miraculous manifestations of God's glory, appearances of angels and theophanies, you know, appearances of God? What about all of the miracles of protection and provision and deliverance and predicting the future and controlling nature? What about all the prophets and prophecy, their words, their dreams, their interpretations of dreams, visions, revelations, trances, and all this other supernatural phenomena? Aren't these things 
that litter the pages of Scripture from beginning to end, aren't they relevant to the debate at hand as well? I would actually argue that, especially in the case of this prophetic stuff, it is in fact more relevant to the cessationist debate than, you know, calling fire from heaven or parting the Red Sea. Why? Because these are the very things that Joel said were going to increase in the last days. So this rare miracle argument infers that cessationism is true and normal because miracle workers are rare. But guys, even if miracle workers were rare, how would that support cessationism? The continuation of the gifts applies not only to a certain kind of miracle, it applies to things like tongues and prophecy, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and all the stuff that we read about in 1 Corinthians 12. But this is that pickpocket move that I was talking about earlier. They dangle this miracle worker category distraction in front of your face to misdirect you while they rob you, with the other hand, of all of the gifts of the Spirit. Don't fall for it. First of all, that miracle worker hypothesis itself is fallacious and full of holes. And even if it were sound, it still wouldn't help their cessationist argument. The whole argument is moot. But since we're specifically talking in this episode about miracles, let's just take a moment to catch this little red cessationist herring and have a look at it for a second. Guys, I see no reason for us to accept the premise that the definition of miracle is limited to some certain special variety of supernatural phenomena, like calling fire from heaven, parting the Red Sea, and raising the dead. Look, when Jesus told his disciples that they would receive power in Acts 1.8, that word power is dunamis. That is the same word that's used for miracles in 1 Corinthians 12.10. So let's look at the day of Pentecost. What happened? What was that miraculous manifestation of the dunamis of the Spirit? It was speaking in tongues. Tongues were considered a miraculous sign. So what I'm saying here is that this arbitrarily limited definition of miracle workers that cessationists use to make this rare miracle or rare miracle worker argument is not valid as a premise. And I think I could make this point from the Septuagint too if I had time. But look, Daniel interpreting the king's dream was absolutely miraculous. Ezekiel's and Jeremiah's and Isaiah's revelations and visions and dreams and prophetic words, all of that was miraculous too. I, I think Samuel being able to tell Saul where his lost donkeys were was miraculous. I think Samson ripping a lion apart with his bare hands was miraculous. I think it was miraculous when David killed Goliath. I think Solomon's wisdom was miraculous. And I could go on and on and on. Guys, who is the cessationist pope that gets to decide what is and isn't a miracle or a miracle worker? Here's what's interesting. This is exactly the same thing that happened to Jesus. You might find it interesting to know that the miracles of Jesus actually failed to meet the arbitrary Procrustean bed standards of the Pharisees of his day as well. You know, Matthew 12 says that he healed a blind man with a withered hand in verse 13. Then in verse 22, he healed a demonized, blind, and mute man so that he spoke and saw. And in verse 15, it says that great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. And then in that same chapter, just a few verses later, the scribes and Pharisees say, we want to see a sign from you in verse 38. Now look at that language. We want to see a sign. Wait, healing blind people isn't good enough? Casting out demons isn't good enough? Healing everyone in a great multitude isn't good enough? Nope. It doesn't match the definition of a sign that our theology textbook say it should, so that's not good enough. We're just going to ignore all of the evidence because of a technicality. And you know what? I have a sneaking suspicion that their definition of miracle was probably exactly what cessationist teachers mean when they talk about miracle workers. These Pharisees probably wanted Jesus to part the sea like Moses or call fire down from heaven like Elijah. And you know what? Jesus only gave them one sign, one miracle in that category. In verse 39, he said that no sign would be given them, you know, that wicked and perverse generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. What was that? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And what was that talking about? The resurrection, right? So that is the one sign that fit the category of sign that the Pharisees sought. And guess what? Even then, they still wouldn't believe. You know, what's ironic. It's usually the cessationists quoting this verse to Charismatics. You know, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks a sign. But look, Jesus was giving them lots of signs. He was performing miracles all the time. So he wasn't saying that a wicked and perverse generation believes God for miracles. No, he was saying that it's a wicked and adulterous generation 
that can look a miracle right in the face and mock it and dismiss it and reject it because it doesn't meet some arbitrary definition. And why was that a wicked and adulterous generation that does that? Because we're talking about something here that is even worse than simple unbelief. It is willful unbelief. None so blind as those who will not see, right? Now, originally what I was going to do is get a whiteboard out, write every book of the Bible on it, and then go through it and show you how silly this rare miracle worker argument is. Because even by their cessation of standards, miracles are still the biblical norm. I mean, if you just take the books that were written by or about the individuals that Tom Pennington mentioned, you know, Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, and the apostles, we're still talking about like 35 out of 66 books, including the entire New Testament. Okay, and that's by the most restrictive definition of miracle. But if we take a slightly more reasonable and biblical definition of miracles and miracle workers, then you can't find cessationism anywhere in the Bible. You know, for example... The cessationist teacher, Richard Gaffin Jr., defines miracles like this. He says, quote, I will accept that a miracle occurs when God does something less common or extraordinary and highly unusual, end quote. Now, this is better, but even this is honestly probably begging the question, because how can we even debate whether miracles are a normal part of the Christian experience or not when the very definition of miracle considers them less common and highly unusual? But still, regardless, if we accept this definition of miracle, then miracles and miracle workers are in virtually every book of the Bible, except obviously in some books that were written for other purposes. But you know, even books like First and Second Chronicles, which are history and genealogies, they give us accounts like the glory of God filling the temple at its dedication so much that the priests couldn't stand to minister and fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifices and so on. So not very cessationist, in my opinion. And then there's books like Ruth, you know, which was a, a love story. And yeah, no miracles there that I know of. Esther doesn't have any miracle workers either. But again, Esther doesn't mention God. So by that logic, by cessation's logic, should we conclude that God doesn't exist? However, you could actually argue that the entire story of Esther is a story of a miracle that saved an entire ethnic group. Yeah, it doesn't look like Moses or Elijah, but does that make it any less miraculous? Then, of course, you have books like Job, and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. These are wisdom literature, poetry, prayers, hymns, psalms, and so on. And no, these don't tell a lot of stories of miracle workers because that's not their purpose, it's not their genres. But a lot of these books would have been written in the same time period as men like David and Samuel, and there were some really wild, miraculous things going on. So guys, the bottom line is this. I'm not seeing any cessationist periods of history here. Actually, no, I stand corrected. There is one cessationist period. And I want to show it to you where it is in the Bible. It's right here. I don't know if you can see this, but it's the spot between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. This represents a 300-year period that is known as the intertestamental period. And it was commonly believed among Jews that after Malachi was written, prophetic inspiration ceased in Israel. For example, one book from the Pseudepigrapha, 2 Baruch 85 Verse 3 says, quote, But now the righteous have been assembled and the prophets are sleeping. Also, we have left our land, and Zion has been taken away from us, and we have nothing now apart from the Mighty One and His law. End quote. And you have to realize that it's against this backdrop of a cessationist season in the history of Israel, in which there is no prophetic inspiration anymore, that we actually enter into the New Testament. At this time, before the New Testament begins. It's a season of Israel in which there is no longer a powerful presence of God in the midst of his people. There is no glory in the Holy of Holies. There are no prophets anymore in Israel. There is no word of the Lord in the land. All of the Elijahs are gone. All the Jeremiahs are gone. All the Isaiahs and Moseses and Daniels are gone. And now Israel is subjected to nasty, heathen, pagan, idolatrous, immoral, cruel foreign Gentiles, the Romans. And the people of God, as Baruch says, have nothing apart from the Holy One and his written law. But then look at how Luke starts his gospel. He's trying to show us something here. We barely cross the threshold into Luke's gospel 
before he confronts us with the theme of prophetic inspiration. The narrative begins with a priest by the name of Zechariah, to whom the angel appears and announces the birth of his son, a prophet named John. And this is going to occur despite the fact that Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, is very old and unable to conceive in the natural. So a miraculous conception. In the very next story, an angel appears to the Virgin Mary and announces the miraculous conception of the birth of Christ. And the angel tells her exactly how this is going to come about. The Holy Spirit, he says, will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. By the way, the Greek word that's being used there for power is the word dunamis, which we talked about earlier. That is what overshadows Mary in the first chapter of Luke. And this is also what Jesus promises will come upon his disciples in the first chapter of Acts. So returning to Luke, still in the very first chapter, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesies. Then Mary prophesies. Then Zechariah prophesies. And then when we get to the next chapter, Jesus is presented at the temple and Simeon prophesies and Anna prophesies. Then we get to chapter three and we're already introduced to an adult John the Baptist who is himself prophesying, baptizing and introducing us to Jesus who is the one to come who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so it's easy to see what Luke is trying to show us. A new era has begun. When we come into this new covenant, we are talking about an era where now, once again, prophetic inspiration is flowing. The Holy Spirit is filling God's people again. And this is what characterized the new covenant. It is the power of the Holy Spirit filling God's people. God's dunamis is flowing. God's people are filled with the Spirit, and they begin to prophesy. You know that story of the Spirit of Moses coming upon the 70 elders, and the story of the Spirit of Elijah coming upon Elisha, and so on. These were foreshadowing a greater reality a time when the spirit of the Messiah, the spirit of Christ, would come upon the people of God. And so here's the reality, that even if this rare miracle theory stood up to scrutiny, which it does not, it still would not follow that we should expect the supernatural to be rare today. Why? Because the whole point of the new covenant is that the Holy Spirit has come to abide with us forever. Maybe the Old Testament should almost seem cessationist, compared to this new covenant reality that Jesus purchased with his own blood. According to Joel, in these last days, the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. These are the days when sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. When Jesus declared the inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven, accompanied by signs and wonders and miracles, he never withdrew that. There is no biblical indication whatsoever that there would be some days after the last days when the spirit that had been poured out on all flesh would be withdrawn again. And instead of living in the time of greatest divine activity, it would become the time where all prophetic activity and all miraculous activity would cease. That is not biblical. And so, yes, it's true that the ministries of people like Elijah and Elisha looked different from those of people like Jeremiah and Isaiah. So what? There is no need to read something into Scripture that it doesn't say. There is absolutely no biblical reason to think that after Joshua died, cessationism was the norm until Elijah came along. And then after Elisha died, cessationism took over again until Jesus was born. And then after the last apostle died, cessationism became the norm ever since. Guys, that is utterly ridiculous. In reality, the ministries of all of these Old Testament figures were supernatural, whether it was Daniel or Isaiah or Ezekiel, Samuel, Jeremiah, whoever it was, God was working in and through them, and that's the point. God is always working. God is always speaking. He's always moving in supernatural ways among men. And yes, there are different kinds of expressions. There are different ways that the dunamis of God manifests, different manifestations of the Spirit, as Paul said. That's actually the whole point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 12 when he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And the obvious answer to that is no. But Paul is clear that although there are varieties of gifts, it is the same Spirit. And although there are varieties of service, it is the same Lord. And although there are varieties of activities, it is the same God that empowers them all in everyone. So again, even if this rare miracle worker idea was true, even if there were only a handful of periods in biblical history where God performed miracles through uniquely appointed messengers in the past, that is not a premise for cessationism, guys. 
Look, a theory based on deductions, especially weak and irrational ones, should never be able to trump explicit statements of fact and direct commands from Scripture. Jesus commanded his followers to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils. And that command was never revoked and never abrogated, even when his initial instructions to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel gave way to the Great Commission. The model in the book of Acts was one of supernatural life, where gifts of the Spirit and miracles and the power of God is normal. And then the epistles go on to reinforce the miraculous nature of life in the Spirit, including explicit commands not to forbid tongues, to seek the gift of prophecy, and to covet the spiritual gifts. And guys, the only thing that should be able to trump those direct commands from Scripture, those direct orders, is another direct order. And in all of Scripture, there is not one. Okay, now in the next episode, we're going to return to the story of Procrustes because it doesn't end very well for him. Remember, he was that guy that was kidnapping people and torturing them to make them fit his bed. Well, this is actually a cautionary tale that has a warning for cessationist teachers about what happens when you're willing to compromise truth to push a predetermined position. And like I said, if you think that I've been hard on cessationist teachers so far, just wait. You haven't seen anything yet. Now we're starting to get close to the reason that I've called this series the heresy of cessationism. And if you think that's strong language, just stay with me. We're on a roll now. So once again, please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss a single episode of what's coming up on Daniel Kalenda, Off the Record. 